Hallelujah. If you would turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 36. And I just wanted to say happy Memorial Day to everyone. I don't know if we have anyone in here that has served in the armed forces. Do we have anyone in here that has served? Okay. If you have, well, praise God. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Hallelujah. I began to think about Memorial Day and what, what it represents. And it represents those that went out and fought in battle for our country and lost their lives doing so. And I'm grateful that we have men and women that will do that, that will fight and sacrifice for their families and sacrifice for our own freedom. And then I began to think about Jesus. And I began to think about how he shed his blood and spared his life for all of humanity that we could be with him and how grateful that what these men and women do represent what Jesus did on Calvary. And I'm grateful for that. And I thank you for those who have served or have family member members that have served. Something that has been burning in my heart Nia and I went to visit Pastor Larson, and we were talking about some things, and we were talking about the inward man. And all of a sudden, the title to this message came forth, and it's, my message is entitled, There is an inside man doing an inside job. There's an inside man doing an inside job. And that, when we were in his office, the office began to be filled with the presence of God. And each one of us were like, there's an inside man. We have a man on the inside that's doing the job within us. And I said, I got to preach that. And Pastor Larson's like, I got to preach that. And we looked at Naya, and she's like, I got to preach that. So we're like, that. So I texted him the other day. I said, I got first dibs. I'm going to preach that. So there's an inside man doing an inside job. There is nothing that you can do as a human to change your own heart. So take that burden off yourself. Okay, because you don't have to do it. Jesus has already done it. Your job as a believer is to position yourself in Christ and let the inside man do what he is supposed to do. And that is work on the inside. And then if he's working on the inside, you're going to see a moving on the outside. So don't look for the manifestation of something first. He wants to start with your heart. Yes. See, you're going to see the manifestation of whatever you've been asking for, whatever you've been seeking for, whatever you've been praying for, whatever you've been knocking for. Yes. But the first step is for you as a believer to position yourself in your relationship with Christ that the inside man can do an inside job. Amen. Hallelujah. And the scripture reads starting at... You got me, Emmanuel? Is it up? No, 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 no. Go to the slideshow. I just graciously put the scripture on me. <laughs> All right. So I love this. I love PowerPoints. I'm a visual person. So you can actually see what I'm talking about. And I looked for this picture, and I thought it was a perfect picture of an inside man doing an inside job. Because the fire of God, when he moves on the inside of you, everything that's not of him is going to be burned up. Everything that's not of God is going to be moved out of the way. So the fire of God, the Holy Spirit, moves on the inside of you. And Ezekiel chapter 36, starting at verse 24. 36, starting at verse 24. And the scripture reads, For I will take you from among the heathen, and I will gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and 
you shall be clean. Amen. From all, from all, all right, we got to remember this, from all of your filthiness and from all of your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart of flesh and I will and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I have given your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Hallelujah. I can really sit down after that because the scripture, the scripture speaks for itself. The word of God is anointed and I believe in that God wants to do a work this morning. And I'm asking him to help me because this message, I usually come up here and it's just like fire. But this message is more of a teaching message. Sometimes we have to go back to the basics. Sometimes we get lost in the circumstances and situations of everyday life. And then we start missing it. And sometimes we just got to come back to the basics. And I want to talk about an instant work. There was an instant work. Of sanctification, I mean, of justification. Instantly justified, legally declared innocent. Instantly, the moment you said yes to Jesus Christ, He instantly, the Holy Spirit, took you and placed you in the person of Christ. And then there's a progressive work. And see, we like instant work. Instant is good, right? Instant, instant mashed potatoes, instant in the microwave. It's, nobody wants to cut up anything. Nobody really wants to do the work to prepare that good meal, you know? You just want an instant work. And I love the way that Paris Reagan, I know he comes here often, and also uh, Pastor Bob Cornell, they both said it, and I don't know, I think it originated from Pastor Bob, but they said instant sanctification, I mean justification, so instantly, but then it's progressive <laughs> sanctification, then glorification, so glorification is going to be an instant work, Hallelujah. justification is an instant work, yes, yes. but we have that in between period that none of us really like to go through, but need to go yes. through, of sanctification. Which is a day-by-day -day process of change. Yes, yes. A day-by-day -day process that we need to walk through, positioning ourselves in Christ, knowing who we are, and allowing the inside man to do an inside job. Amen. And then there's a work of eternal work of glorification. And I can't wait to worship around the throne Hallelujah. of God with you. Because it's going to be an awesome day. And I look forward to that day. But while God has us here on earth, we need to allow the inside man to do an inside job. So we can see people like Jesse and the Holy Spirit move on the inside of him. And begin an inside job that went on to, and I'm sorry man, but I don't know your name. What's your name? Kayla, move on the inside of her and do an inside job and the fire of God begin to ripple. And I know we met your son, right? Your son was at the, the baptism as well. So we're going to just see it ripple throughout the family because that's what God does. He starts with one and he uses that one vessel that surrendered to him that is willing to give their life to him and the Inside job. Yes, yes. And what I love is God began to re reveal to me. See, He was just refreshing my memory. And He began to reveal to me, Angela, I'm not, I wasn't just working when you said yes to me. I was working before. Right. I was working the whole time. I was setting the whole stage. Every time that a circumstance arose in my life that was meant to get me to call out to Jesus, the Holy Spirit was drawing me. 
Yes. See, the, the scripture says that no man come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. So we're drawn by the Spirit of God. You can't even, until the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside you, you can't even love the Lord. You can't even desire to sit with the Lord. Nothing about sinful humanity wants anything to do with Jesus Christ. So it's only the Spirit that can do the work. And thank God that He continues to draw us. So the setting of this story... <clears throat> Buckle in, all right? The setting of this story is talking about the regathering of Israel and the restoration of Israel. Why do they have to be regathered and why do they have to be restored? They're God's people. Well, let's see. They found themselves in Babylonian captivity, the people of God. Yeah. See, if we're not careful, as people of God, we can come uh, become entrapped in sin ourselves, in bondage ourselves, in wrong thinking ourselves. Even a believer right, right, struggles. Right. The struggle is real. Yeah. But God is greater than our struggle. God is greater than bondage. Yeah. God is greater than our captivity. And there are things that God wants to change in his people. Amen. And why? Why did they end up in Babylonian captivity? Because they were disobedient. They were disobedient to the word of God. They were disobedient to the voice of God. They were disobedient to the leading of God. They were disobedient. And what else can get us there? Lack of proper faith. Mm -hmm. Looking at ourselves to be able to accomplish what God can only accomplish in your right. life. Right. What God can only put forth in a heart of man. So we can end up in captivity still as the people of God. And I've been there. Yeah, I've been there. But God is a jealous God. And he's not going to relent until he has it all. He doesn't want just a portion of your heart. He doesn't want just a portion of our lives. He doesn't want just a portion of your mind. He wants the whole thing. He wants the whole man surrendered to him. And he's not going to stop. But what I love about Jesus is he's not going to force himself on you. He's going to woo you. He's going to call you. He's going to knock on the heart, on your heart. And I'm talking to believers. Right, right. Come on. Yep. He's going he's gonna to just be like, speak to you softly. You know you shouldn't be going that way. Amen. You know you shouldn't be doing that. And there goes, there, there's going to be a constraining power that comes over you. It's like hitting the brakes when you're driving and somebody stops in front of you. And it's like, Arr! and you, you, you feel the constraining power of God constrain you and keep you from a wrong direction or a, a wrong mindset or a, a temptation that's set before you. He'll begin to constrain you as you look to him. But we have a choice. I love that scripture. Choose this day whom you will serve. Choose this day. See, every day right. is a choice mm -hmm. that we're going to have to make to serve this Lord. The Lord. Choose this day. And you have a free will to do so. That's right. Mm -hmm. I've seen many people in my walk with the Lord in the last 10 years, be serving the Lord on fire for God and turn away from Him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I and I, and I continuously same. choose this day. Choose this day. Each and every day, choose this day yeah. who you're going to serve. And, and God, God will do the work. See, and that's what I love because there's no burden for you to carry. There's nothing for you to bear. All you have to do is surrender and sit with him. And sometimes that sounds easy to do, but sometimes it's really hard to do. And I understand that, but God also understands that. And he's not going to leave you in your struggle. And he's not going to leave you in captivity. See, he let them go into captivity to teach them a lesson. He let them go there to teach them to follow after him. To teach 
teach them to believe him, to teach them to trust him. And he allowed it until they repented. See, everybody in heaven is going to want to be there. And I thought about that. I was like, wow, Lord, that's true. Yeah. There's not going to be one person in heaven that's not going to want to be there. We're all going to want to be there. <laughs> we're all going to have followed after him all of our lives, and we're all going to be happy to be there. He's not going to force one person there. That's right. We're going to want to be there. And these people, they were in captivity, and they were disobedient to the voice of God. And I told you he's a holy and he's a jealous God. And he's going to deal with our idols. What are idols? Idols are things. And that's why they were there. They started hanging out with the world. Mixing with the things of this world. The heathen. And idols began to appear in their lives. They began, he, they began to put other things before God. That's right. Anything that you put before God is an idol. And he will tear it down. Amen. Praise God, he tears it down. Amen. You know, I when I was as I walked with the Lord, I be, began to see more and more as I surrendered to him that in the beginning I used to be like, man, why can't I have that? Or why can't I do this? And and it it would tear at me. Like I would begin to have a wrong I'm just putting myself out there for anybody that needs to hear it. I began to have a wrong mindset or viewpoint or perspective about the Lord. Like he was an unjust God. But he was doing it for my own well-being. Mm -hmm. He was doing it so I can walk in life, that I can walk in freedom. He was doing it because he knew whatever that thing was, was going to bring hurt to my relationship with him. And was going to bring hurt to my own life. And sometimes when we're, when we're in that surrendered spot, we can't always see that. We don't even always see from A to Z. And I don't remember who, who, who spoke about it, but they were talking about being at a football game or being at a game. And the person that's sitting down low can't always see everything from A to Z. Oh, no, it was a parade. I'm sorry. Let me correct myself. It was a parade. And this was really good. Because when you go through a parade right in front of you, it's just what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. But if you were up in the top in a balcony somewhere or in the top of a building, you could see the whole parade. Mm -hmm. You could see from the, the beginning of the parade all the way to the end of the parade. But the people that are sitting low can only see the portion of the parade right. that's in front of them. And that's sometimes how we are. Well, it is how we are. We can't see the right. beginning and the end. We can only see the portion of life that's right in front of us. But we have to trust the one yes. that can see the beginning and who can see the end. And know that he is not unjust. How can we call him unjust when he died for us on Calvary? Amen. And that's what I have to remind myself of daily. What is the character of the God that we serve? He is a good God. He is a loving God. He is a merciful God. He is a kind God. He is a giving God. He is a blessing God. I have to remember these things. And we have to recall back to remembrance when we're in that stretching place when we're in that surrendered place because I don't want to end up back in captivity yeah. I don't want to end up back where I came from uh. I don't want to go there I have set my heart on Jesus and I'm going to continue to follow him all the days of my life by the grace of God I'm going to choose this day whom I will serve That's it. Hallelujah. and what I liked about this is, I don't know much about football. I looked this up, okay? So give me a break, okay? <laughs> I was just a cheerleader, okay? That's all I did was cheer, all right? But I liked this, is it says, and if I'm wrong, correct me, okay? That the fullback is the one that protects the running back. Is that correct, gentlemen? Okay. <laughs> and I started thinking about it, how the Holy Ghost is our fullback. Yeah. And he is full of power. Hallelujah. He is full of power. And you are the running back. And you're trying to get from one end of the field 
to the other end of the field and everything is coming to eat your lunch and take you out and hurt you and harm you. They're coming for blood. Football is not like, woo -hoo. No, they're coming after you. It's a violent sport, okay? Can I say it that way? And our walk with Jesus at times, the Calvary was a violent act, okay? Listen, stay close to your fullback. Yes, stay yes. close to the Holy Spirit yes. as you're running this race with Jesus because he's going to knock everything out of your way as you stay close to him. But let me tell you, if you get away from your fullback, somebody's going to take you out. Yes. Something's going to take you out. Yes. And then the, even knock the ball out of your hand, knock the wind out of you for a moment. Yes. So stay close to your fullback so that you can get that touchdown so you can get in the end zone so we can get to glory so we can get to the land see and they're not just one game it's a game after game after game after game after game and we have to be those on the sidelines cheering each other on to keep going and keep running and keep staying close to Jesus stay close to the fullback Stay close to the Holy Spirit because God wants to establish an inward man in you. He wants to build up an inward man, an inward manifestation of holiness in you. And I know when I look in the mirror, so I don't have to look in your mirror and see you because I know when I look in my mirror and see me, I can see many imperfections. Right, right. I can see many things that don't line up or don't quite fit, but God is continuously working on us. So don't be discouraged this day. Right. Don't be discouraged right. where you're at. And if you have a heart to see those things change, you better believe they will change. They will change. Some things take a little bit longer than other things, but you can guarantee it that God said it and he's going to do it. So it's going to change. Whatever that thing is, it's going to change. And I love about the, the disciples, because if you ever really read about them and really pay attention to their characteristics, you can see how human they are. Like sometimes you read the Bible and you're like, wow, these great men of God. But then we see Peter's temper and we see um, Samson messing up and we see David and his, and his and we see all these. If you really pay attention to the Bible, we can see the humanity of man. And that's what I love about it is because I don't have to be perfect because I serve a perfect God. Yes, yes. And I'm in a perfect God. Yes. You are in a perfect God. Yes. And he wants to establish his kingdom in you first. And the disciples, after they seen Jesus die on the cross, after they seen him raised from the dead, he came back in the book of Acts and they said, or they basically asked the question, Lord, will thou at this time Restore again the kingdom of Israel. They were asking him for an outward manifestation of the kingdom already being restored. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father has put into his own power. But you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And I, I've i read verses 6 and 7, and I don't know why, but I never like thought about verse 8 going along with verse 6 and, six and 7. Don't ask me why. But I didn't. And I began to think they wanted to see an outward manifestation of the kingdom do you think of something in your life right now that you want to see the manifestation of it already. Right, right. But because I have something in my life, I'm, I'm ready, Lord, to see the manifestation of what you're going to do. I'm expecting to see the manifestation of what you're going to do. But then the Lord hits you with this: It is not for you to know. <laughs> right. right. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down in me. And let me do it in you so that I can work it. I can work it out. He said, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. But you shall receive power. Yes, yes. See, it, it, you, might, you might not see it yet. Right, right. And you might not know when it's going to happen because it's not for you to know. But God's going to give you the power yes. to be a witness for him. 
that the grace of God is changing you and is working in you and working in your life that you can travel through the process of sanctification yes. in power and in grace. Hallelujah. See, and it's going to make you a witness. See, Troy witnessed to you, right? Jesse, Robert, witness to you. But I bet you, if they came up to you and just told you about Jesus, but weren't living for Jesus, it wouldn't have much of an effect on you. Because you wanted a, you needed a living Savior. You needed something that was tangible, something that you can be like, oh, I see it, I believe it, and I'm going to, I'm going that way. Because if it worked for them, it's going to work for me. And I have people in my past life that ju even just text me on Facebook. I make a little bit, a little video inviting people to come out here right before service. And a girl from New Jersey who I used to do drugs with texted me and said, and wrote on Facebook, Ange, I love you. This is powerful. I wish I was there. I want to come there because I'm not just preaching the gospel. My lifestyle is showing the gospel. And I pray to God that every day there's an inward man doing an inward job that others that I used to run with or others that I meet are able to see this inward man at work. Amen. This inward, see, our lives are meant to touch the world and touch Amen. eternity as we walk with him. Amen. So don't be concerned Amen. with the outward kingdom at this moment. Be concerned with the kingdom that God's trying to build <laughs> in your heart. His kingdom for his glory alone. And I love this because after you get saved, you get you have a baptism. Is it going back? There we go. You have a baptism, and a lot of the kids got baptized. Here are some pictures of here of the kids getting baptized. Listen, you don't get baptized just because you want to get baptized. You get baptized because there's an inward work going on right, on right. the inside, and you want to proclaim that I'm. I'm in Jesus, yeah. and when he died, I died, and when he rose, I rose with him in the power of God. Yeah. And these children believe that, and Jesse and Jesse, what's his name? Shane, <laughs> Shane, believe that, and they outwardly it was an outward manifestation of the inward man yeah. doing an inside job. Yeah. Hallelujah! <laughs> Hallelujah. God makes a promise that he intends to keep. And Ezekiel 36, verse 24, he said, I will take you from among the heathen. Did he not do that? Did he not do that for you and I? Did he not do that already? He took us out of the world. He took us out of sin. He took us out of bondage. To take means to carry away, to seize, to send for, and to win. Well, let me put it to you this way. He sent for you by the Holy Spirit. And then he carried you away. He translated you from darkness into his marvelous light. He sent for you. Then he carried you away and translated you from darkness into his marvelous light. But then he seized you. He seized you. And he arrested your heart. And he put his Holy Spirit in you as a seal of approval. I approve of this vessel covered by the blood of my son. I approve of this one. And then it means also to win. Well, it's finished. He already won. He already won. You're a winner today. You're a winner today. So you can remember that this is what he's done. He's taken you from a and gathered you out of the countries. And I began to think, even um, our brother who talks about Mexico and talks about Peru and talks about all these different places, we have people all over this world worshiping one God, yes. worshiping the Lord, serving him every tongue. So, he, <laughs> so his word is true. I'll take you out from the heathen and I'll gather you from all countries. And I was running at the LSU Lake the other day, and there's one part portion of the LSU Lake that I'm telling
telling you like five steps forward on each side, there's a different denomination. And there's about six different churches on this one street and a different denomination. And I'm running and now I'm praying because I've ran that four miles a lot. And I've seen like one church and then I've seen like another church, but I, it never clicked that all these churches are sitting in this one area. And I was like, man, what if we all got together? What if? What if we tore down the walls of denomination and we served one God and we read one word and we followed the one and the true and the living God and we let go of all our manly wisdom and all our manly rules and we all got together and we just worshiped the Lord together? What would it do to LSU? What would it do to that surrounding area for those churches to just open one building and read one word and serve one God. And I was like, Lord, you just want, it's just one, one body. We're one body with one head. Hallelujah. Because Jesus said, any man come to me that is thirsty, come. Any man that is thirsty, come. Any man, that means any gender, any race, any um background, any economical status, it doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor, doesn't matter what you've been through, doesn't matter your bondage, it doesn't matter at all. He said, all come, all come. So the next time you see somebody that doesn't look like you, that doesn't walk like you, that doesn't act like you, Jesus wants them to come too. So instead of turning away like the priest and the Levite did, the good Samaritan was the only one that stopped. But the man of God, the priest and the Levite, just left the good Samaritan, left the man there until the good Samaritan came. And I was so touched by that story because I was like, these were supposed to be men of God. How many times have we just passed by somebody that didn't look like us or walk like us or talk like us? And I'm speaking from experience. I'm speaking from the heart. I'm speaking from my own conviction. And walk the other way or turn the other cheek and be wise. But still, can we give Jesus? Can we pour oil on their wounds? Can we bandage them up? Can we bring them in the household of God so they can get what they need? And he said, I'll bring you into your own land. You have your own land and you have your own walk with Jesus. You have your own inheritance. God has given you an inheritance off the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. Right. You have your own land. So he said, I'm going to take you out from the heathen, gather you in, and bring you into your own land. Well, there's giants in the land still. Even though you have a land, and that land is purchased with the blood of Jesus, there's still giants in the land. Pastor Swagger says, it's the clinging vines of the fall or the inward bent. <clears throat> no stinking thinking that we sometimes have right. that flesh. Well, what I want to tell you this morning is I used to think this, so I'm going to put it out there. Sometimes I thought that we would like, we were in Christ. And then once we were in Christ, if I mess, it's going to become clearer and clearer and clearer. So as we're walking this path of faith, and grace and faith and grace that path is going to become clearer and clearer and clearer so the same way that you have received Christ by faith and grace is the only way that you can still walk in him and the only means to approach God grace is the effectual working of the Holy Spirit it's a character of God reflected in the heart of man so what do you mean? God's character can be reflected in your heart. Yes. Yes. There's an inside man doing an inside job. Yeah. Amen. That's what's going on. Uh -huh. his, his character is being implanted in you. So dwell in the land that you have been given. Well, what is the land that I have been given? Well, you have power. So the moment that instantaneously work of justification, the moment you were saved, you had all that you needed to walk this thing out. Right. The moment you were saved, you were equipped with all that you need to face every 
giant, every temptation, every circumstance, every place that Satan comes to destroy you, you have the power to walk in victory. You have the power to walk in deliverance. You have direction from the word of God. See, the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. Read your instruction manual. Yeah. Find out what God says. Because what God says is what's going to stand. You are righteous not based on your own performance, but based on the blood of Jesus. So the next time Satan rolls out the script of everything that you have done wrong, you can say, I am clean, I am clean. And I was like, I would be, I would like, you know that cartoon with the smoke on the heels? <laughs> that would be me. I would like, where is my, and I would grieve that my, of course, my father has passed away. So I do know what it's like to lose your father. But I, I, if there was an inheritance, that because he left me something to keep me, to establish me, to protect me. He left me something that would... Um, keep me healthy and prepare and provision for me. If my father left me provision, he, he meant for me to have it. Right, right, right. And when Jesus died on Calvary, yes. he left you an inheritance and he left it for you to provide for you that you would have it. Hallelujah. So do you occupy the land that you have been given? Mm. Do you protect and guard the land that you have been given? Because you've been given a land. Occupy your land. The scripture reads, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and all your idols, and I will cleanse you. Well, the blood of Jesus is that cleansing agent. Yeah. The blood of Jesus. It says in John, 1 John 1, 7, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Right. Isaiah 118 says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. For your sins were as scarlet, now I have made them white as snow. Yeah. Acts 10 15 says, The voice of the Lord spoke unto him again a second time. What God has cleansed, thou has not called thou not common. Now I want to speak on this scripture for one moment, because I used to beat myself up all the time. The enemy would come in and tell me I was still the same person and he would tell me that I'm going back and he would tell me I'm still bound and he would tell me all these different things and I mean it could have been, been my flesh, it could have been Satan, it doesn't matter which enemy it was, it was still an enemy and the Lord spoke this scripture to me and I will never forget it as long as I, I lived. He said, Angela, I have cleansed you, do not call yourself unclean. And remember that he, what he cleanses, he cleanses. And that's the work that he has done in you. Now, I want to bring this around too. Because we can say, well, we're cleansed and we can do whatever we want. But the Bible says that Romans 6 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. Amen. That's right. Certainly not. He's given you the power and he's given you the inheritance and he's given you the land that the inside man would do an inside job. So that doesn't mean, oh, the blood of Jesus is my cleansing agent and I can just live however I want and do whatever I want. But he said, no, but the Holy Spirit has come upon you that you should re receive power, that you should be witnesses for me. Yes. Not that you should live however you want. Yes. That's right. And that's how they ended up in bondage and captivity. Because they decided that they were going to mix with the world and do what they wanted to do and they became captive mm -hmm. as God's people. And there's a warning in this message today that we do not want to mingle with the things of this world. That we don't even, a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Amen. So you better get the leaven out and look to the blood of Jesus that is your constant cleansing agent. It's a constant. 
is always there. And his grace is always there. Okay, Angela, so I need that power. Yes, you have the power to walk free from sin. And you remember that Jesus has now unplugged the sin nature. He has now been done away with sin. He has now rendered idle your sin. It is no longer there. It has no power over you. No circumstance, no situation has any power over you. You have been given a new heart and a new spirit. Let's see. Can you go to the next one for me? The next one after that. He has given you a heart transplant. Amen. He has given you a heart transplant. That which was failing, you have been given a whole new one. You have been given a whole new heart. A heart that responds to God when you never responded to God before. A heart that hears the voice of God when you couldn't hear His voice before. A heart that desires to please God and to do His will. A heart that is driven by the moving and the operation of His Spirit. A heart that has a heart for people. A heart that has a heart for your neighbor. A heart that loves God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. He has given you not just a heart, but a spiritual eyes to see. He has given you discernment. Yes. He sit in the presence of God, sit in prayer, and he will speak to you words of wisdom. And he will give you direction. And he will give you eyes to see. That's right. Less of me and more of him. Ezekiel 36, 27 says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. This is that sanctification, that journey, that progressive work. I will put my inside man on your inside and he will do the work. See, there's an inside man doing an inside job. So I just want to go through this. If you would go to the next slide real quick. An example of the potter. He's the potter and we're the clay. And this process of sanctification, it needs to be done so he can build his kingdom. And if you would go to the next slide, he takes dry clay, dead, dry. Now I want you to put yourself in the clay spot. Dead and dry. And he begins sifting foreign matter. Any foreign matter that is in the clay will be sifted. So what he does is he removes sin from you. He removes sin at Calvary from you. And after it's done sifting, I love this, because you take the clay and you put it in water. Well, you, listen, when we're saved, we need the water and the operation of the Holy Spirit to begin to change us and move us, refresh us and heal us. And touch us. So you put it in water until it becomes it becomes one. See, you have become one with Jesus Christ. Sin has been taken away. The Holy Spirit has now moved in, and you have become one with Jesus. Once you become one with Jesus, you are now pliable and shapeable and movable. If you would go to the next slide. After this takes place and you have yielded to the potter's hands, there's a wedging that takes place. That means that he needs all the air bubbles and forces the air out. Oh, you said we know what I'm talking about, huh? Uh -huh. He begins to work and it's not always comfortable. There's a wedging. The clay begins to learn the power of the potter's hands. And the potter begins to need as, see, the clay has to work with the potter. There has to be a relationship with the clay and the potter, and they have to be in, in agreement, but ultimately the clay must submit to the potter's hands. Then the next slide, there's a centering 
that happens. And there, what it does is a potter creates a hole. See, there's an inside work going on. The centering, there's a hole that's going on. See, the, the potter wants to get down deep in those places that you don't even want to revisit again. And he wants to heal and mend and restore and rebuild and do something on the inside, a centering. Well, you know what you need to do? Set her up with him. You set her up with him. The clay has to be in the center of the wheel. And then the next slide, there's a pulling. Ooh, it doesn't stop. It just keeps going. There's a, a pulling that happens. And what happens with the pulling is that there's a vertical growth. There's a growth in your faith. See, you are growing. You are in the process of growth. You have growing pains going on. But what happens is when the potter is pulling, it's defying gravity. So what the potter is doing in your life is contrary to what humanity wants and what the human nature wants. So the pulling, okay, creates a growth in your relationship with him. But in this process, the clay begins to trust the potter. Amen. And that the potter is not there to destroy the clay. Right. And then after the pulling, you mean there's more? Yes, there's more. There's a stretching, pulling, then a stretching, okay? And he's working, and he's working, and at this point in the stretching, the walls begin to get very thin. Have you ever felt like you were going to be destroyed in this process? Yes, well, he is destroying any old bents or any flesh or any sin that might stand between you and him. And there's a pulling and there's a stretching that's going on. And then there's a cutting. Yes, there is a cutting process. And during this cutting process, there's different tools that are used. Listen, you're going to travel through life and God is going to use different people, different circumstances, right, right. different situations to begin to work as you surrender to him and he cuts. You surrender to him and he cuts. And, you surrender, and you're pliable and you're shapeable and you're movable and you're letting him do it. And I love it because he never stops working. It's a constant work. If the potter let go of the clay, the clay would just cave in. So his hands are constantly upon the clay and constantly working with the clay, moving swiftly but moving softly because if it's too powerful, the clay would cave in. So you wonder why it's a process? If he did it all at once, he would destroy us. Amen. So it's a process of growth, of gently working with the clay. But then I like this part is after you're done stretching, the potter goes and he sets the clay aside on the drying wall. It's like after all that, and now you're set aside, and you begin to watch the potter work with other clay. And you begin, the, the clay begins to feel like, has the potter forgotten me? Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt like that? Yeah. You watch God working in other people's lives and you're like, I'm just sitting over here. Lord, why not me? Why not yet? Well, he's allowing the pot to dry because he can't put the handle on the pot until the pot's dry. Amen. See, he needs a vessel that he can pour out. So he's going to let... You sit for a moment. Trust that the potter is going to move. Trust that the potter, he's going to come back. And he's always still there. He's checking on the pot that's sitting to dry. Because at the right time, just in the moment, in that suddenly place, he's ready to put the handle upon the pot. Mm, that's good. And he comes over and he, he puts the handle upon the pot. So it can be poured out, but not only that, I love this because he flips the pot over and he writes the signature mm -hmm. on the bottom of the pot. This vessel is mine. Mm -hmm. And Jesus did that on Calvary. 
So you might feel like you're in this, this sifting process, you're in this centering process, you're in this cutting process and, and pulling process. And sh I don't know what part of the process you're in, but we're all in the process. And then he flips the pot over and says, this is mine. This is mine. This is my vessel. This is mine. And my name is written upon their heart. My name is written upon this vessel. And then he begins to work out the details. He begins to design and he begins to paint and he puts the, he puts the pot in the kiln and in the fire. Uh, this is a long process. Right, right. But in the end, after the fire, the details shine. Only the fire can bring out the details of the pot. See, this process that you're in, God is going to cause his anointing to shine in your life. And you're only going to be able to say, the potter did it. The potter did it. I submitted and the potter did it. And he worked out all the details. And then he puts the pot display he's going to use you for his glory so don't each individual piece that the potter makes is different in size it's versatile it's used for different things we as the body of Christ are used for different things but we're all in the same process yeah, each piece of clay had to go through the same process. But each piece of clay is going to be used for something different. See, the scripture reads, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. See, through this process of working with the potter through faith and grace. The Holy Spirit will do an inside job because there's an inside man doing an inside job. Hallelujah. Naya, if you would please come up. At faith and grace will always produce Christ-likeness. See, Scripture reads, You shall dwell in the land, if you would stand with me, please. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, you shall be my people, and I will be your, your God. To dwell in the land, and this is what I want to encourage you with while we're closing. To dwell in the land means to sit. That means that when you sit down and settle down in Jesus Christ, you take all of the pressure off your muscles, off your nerves, off of you working. When you sit down, you're rested. Dwell means to sit. So sit down in that land that you have be gi been given and remember that Jesus has put an inside man doing an inside job in you and you will see the outward manifestation of what you've been asking for. But don't get off the potter's wheel. Be a vessel for 